thanks for joining me for a very special episode of the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I have uh, a roundtable discussion, which uh, we've done a couple of different roundtable episodes so far, and those are always uh, wildly popular. And uh, we have a Another one today for a brand new project that uh, releases the end of April called Tales of Tinfoil. Tales of Tinfoil is is a collection of stories uh, put together, curated by David Gatewood. And David is with me today, along with Wendy Miller, Chris Porto, Lucas Bale, and Michael Bunker. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Hello. Uh, we're going to start uh, by uh, I'll introduce each one of you and just get you to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what endeared you to this project and uh, what what the stories were that you brought to the table. So, uh, David, I'm going to start with you. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Hank. Thanks for having us on. Um, yeah, first, let me uh, clarify one thing. Tales of Tin Four comes out this Friday, April 17th, not an end of month. So you can get it. Thank you very much for clearing that up. Um, <laughs> I, I was looking at the at the launch party date uh, earlier, and I, I guess that's why I had that date in my mind. I apologize. That, yeah, I'm confused people with a different date on that. But um, yeah, let me give you some background on how this came together, it, and it's pretty short. Um, so last year, um, Michael Bunker and I put together an anthology of short stories called Synchronic: Thirteen Tales of Time Travel, um, uh, and during the launch party for that, we asked folks, do you have any ideas for other anthologies that you'd like to do? And most of the, this was a science fiction crowd, so most of the stuff was things like Aliens and First Contact and stuff like that. But Richard Gleaves, who wrote the first story in this collection, said, how about one about conspiracy theories? And I, as soon as I heard that, I thought that would be really cool. Um, so some other things happened in the interim, but I kept that that idea in mind. And so, uh, you know, when I finally got around the time to do it, I jumped right on it. And of course, uh, Richard, of course, I definitely invited, and in, and Michael as well. Uh, do you, David, uh, contribute a story to the collection? No, I don't. I don't write. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, allegedly, uh, allegedly, right? Uh, and I, I have I've actually read some uh, some books that you've edited, and I think that uh, I think you actually are the author of all of those, that, or at least that's the con- that's the theory. He's uh, onto us. Yeah, yeah. That's, there are some of them that I actually I just threw away the original manuscript and replaced it with another one. <laughs> uh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I read an early copy of Brother Frankenstein, uh, and then I read the copy that came from you, and it's really two completely different stories. Yeah, I think originally it was called Sister Frankenstein, and then Gatewood got a whole of it, a whole different story. I think it was Sister Frankenfurter, but that's another thing. But, yeah. and there's lots more dolphins in it now. Many more, many more, <laughs> many more entire dolphins. chapters. Great, uh, David. You uh, you are an editor, right? That's right. Yeah. How did you uh, how did you become uh, an editor and not just an editor, but uh, one of the most sought after editors for indie publishers? So it's um, it's an odd story. I uh, I was working as um, a data analyst, so I really have never had any background in in letters. I've always been a numbers guy, uh, but I do read a lot, and I had read Wool by Hugh Howey, and For some reason, I decided to let him know about some grammatical errors in it. Um, And how many was it? 163. (laughs) That's the number guy coming out. You've got that number on your computer, haven't you? You've got it like post-it note on your monitor. (laughs) Well, Hugh Hugh has told told this story a few times already, so I've I've had to remember it. Um, Because apparently the subject header of the email I sent him was 163 errors in wool. Um, (laughs) But anyway, from that... I've heard the story from him, too. I I, I wanted to confirm it, that it was... It's true. Okay. It's it's true, and, you know, I didn't know him at the time, but after that... um, When he came out with his next book, he said, do you want to beta read it for me? And I did. Um, So I could tell him his errors before he published them. (laughs) And and then he kept asking me to do a little bit more with each book. And he really kind of coaxed me into the whole editing thing. He's like, man, you got to do more of this. And uh, so it was about a year after that 
I'd only been doing Hugh Howie books, and I said, let me go ahead and do this full time. And um, I, I quit the day job, and this is now what I do. Excellent. So uh, that, by the way, being an editor myself, that is the fantasy origin story of every editor that ever lived. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Uh, I can I can only imagine that's a, that's a surreal uh, entry to to the craft. Uh, so you guys put out uh, Synchronic last year, which is an amazing book. Uh, how did you gather this group of authors to begin with to put out that first anthology? Michael, you want to take that one? Oh uh, yeah, I was hoping you were going to say it all. <laughs> well, <'cause> you did. <laughs> no. Um, I think it was just really um, this awesome um, kind of community of authors have, has kind of sprung up over you know since around 2011, and a lot of us were participating on different Facebook groups and uh, uh, some private writers groups, and so I, I kind of um, had gotten to meet a lot of these writers, and then um, when I got asked to do, I, I don't even remember how the He'll have to tell you how the synchronic thing started. I don't know whether I was like in on the very first day or not, but somehow people asked me if I would talk to authors, and we started talking about which authors to invite. And we thought, you know, we'd probably get maybe fifty percent of of our target uh, authors, the ones that would, and just author after author, everyone we asked said yes. So it was really just kind of kind of miraculous fun. Awesome. Uh, where did the idea for uh, time travel stories come from? Was that just something that uh, that was mutually agreed upon, or was there a, a, a brilliant idea? Where did it come from? Uh, I don't even remember, man. I, I, I got so much stuff going on. I, I remember there was a bunch of emails going around, and there was uh, a few of us talking, and I think uh, David and I kind of started side-channeling uh, talking about it, and Maybe he has a better idea than I do, but I've slept a lot since then. Actually, since this morning. And, <laughs> and I, I have a bad memory for these details. Well, Michael, since you were tagged into the conversation, uh, what story are you contributing to Tinfoil? And, uh, and what is it that, that sparks your imagination about conspiracy theories? Well, I'll start with the second part first. My uh, – my interest in this, first of all, was uh, because David was doing it, and I knew it was going to turn out really nice. And also because he is my editor, I really didn't want to uh, piss him off. And so <laughs> it was both that I wanted to do it and I did not want to tell him I didn't want to do it. So, <laughs> And uh, I've always kind of had a, a, an interest in uh, some conspiracy theories. I, I've read a lot in the JFK uh, stuff, and, you know, and, and I've always had this – this kind of belief that just by calling it a conspiracy theory, you're automatically kind of default. It's almost a conspiracy in itself because you're defaulting people to believe that it's automatically all of it is not true. Right. And any, I'm a historian. And so anybody who knows anything about history knows that history is replete with very, very real conspiracies uh, going all the way <laughs> to and past uh, uh, Rome and the uh, murder of Caesar and, keep you know go on down the line sure. so conspiracies anytime any group of people has power or wants power there are going to be conspiracies and so i don't default to disbelieve any of them in fact i choose in many cases to believe both sides of all of them and so <laughs> i both believe that we did land on the moon and that we didn't and so <laughs> right. because i'm a farmer and they're both e equally plausible and who do i mean who, what i don't know i haven't seen any data you know, so well, yeah, and and, and, and we have giant we have giant sand pits in Mississippi that I am convinced uh, are where the uh, moon landings were filmed. But that's that's well, another conversation. It's very real sense, you know, whether former uh, a thousand years ago or now, you only people give you information and they lie all the time. So I'm just like, yep, yep, I'm with you, fellas. <laughs> but uh, so uh, my particular story is called the um, one arm of the octopus. And I just thought it would be fascinating to, uh, since he asked me to be included in a conspiracy theory anthology, to include a story that is almost predominantly true and, uh, you know, verifiably so. People have actually gone to jail and there are people killed and all kinds of things. And so 
uh, my story is basically uh, a, a personal view on the uh, Contra drug, Mena, Arkansas, um, uh, conspiracy that took place in, in, from the mid '80s into the '90s, and I had a lot of fun writing it. And now, now that story was uh, creating a lot of buzz in the early '90s. I remember, especially with the John Birch Society and a, a lot of those folks. Mina uh, came up quite often, but that story's kind of died down over the last ten years or so, probably. That's really the um, kind of the back background of all conspiracies is that at one point they become they, of their own weight, uh, the sheer weight of facts that people uh, almost default to believe that probably a lot of it's true, but you're never really going to know. And I think that like uh, like some of the bigger conspiracies, that's what's happened with this story. But uh, like I said, a lot of it has been verified. Uh, people have later come out and admitted. I mean, the L.A. Times and the uh, uh, Time Time Magazine, New York Times, all came out and got validated later on. Gary Webb's stories about Dark Dark Alliance and all that, but that all happens privately. So most of the story is true, and I just thought it would be fun to stick a true story in the middle of a conspiracy theory anthology. <laughs> Excellent, uh, Wendy Miller, uh, you're up next. Uh, welcome to the show, and tell us a little bit about your story and and uh, what your fascination with the subject matter is. Okay, great. Um, my story is called Disappear and Fascination with Conspiracy Theories. Um, it was really just more of the challenge that I was very excited about. Um, received word from David, I think it was back in the fall, and I was uh, just beyond excited. I, this, for this opportunity with this um, caliber of authors really, really was and still is, I consider, such an enormous honor. It's, um, and I saw it as a challenge. I, I write, you know, a, sort of a blend of women's fiction, psychological fiction, so I'm like, okay, sci-fi, I'm up for it. I'm going to do this. So um, working with David, he is a phenomenal editor. I can say that just working with him, I was completely impressed by his skills to just rework my story to be the best that it could be. It's a story of a mom that is struggling with um, the, just these really torturous dreams about, and that she knows it means something. And ultimately, um, it, this, these, this dream does come to fruition in a very scary way in her life. And she's wrestling because her daughter is starting to rise up um, as a dissident against the, the government, who is it's a very watchful um it's the surveillance state. <laughs> so they're basically taking over and watching everything you do and um, mandating that the individuals uh, give blood and, and, and they're slowly but surely disappearing people. Um, so, the, you know, it's a very uh, non-trustworthy environment. And I just, I really love to tap into the character psyche and that's probably my favorite part of writing. And so just having this opportunity to do this with these authors, I, I jumped on board. <laughs> Now, the surveillance state is uh, very prominent in the news these days uh, with lots of different whistleblowers and you know all of that stuff. Uh, was there any particular uh, event or story or uh, anything like that that in informed uh, your story or was maybe the catalyst for it? Or is this just uh, kind of seeing these things and, and thinking, how can I take this to the worst possible scenario? You know, no, that's a great question. Actually, uh, my, my daughter, I have a 13-year-old, she did return home from school, and her, the, her English teacher was telling the class that um, now, and I actually worked this into my story, that um, you walk into a store, and uh, if you have your phone on, if you can be monitored, monitor your conversation, and, um, you know, even just, you're constantly being monitored everywhere you go. And I remember, I think I wrote this to David, too. I remember my family recently took a, dis a trip to Disney. And um, just having to give your, um, you know, having to give your fingerprints before you even walk into Disney. It's just, it is, it's all around us. So it was fun to, to explore that to an even greater degree and um, see, see where I could take it, see where, how I could push the characters to a point of, you know, how far, when it gets too far, you know, when I enjoy doing that. So uh, last weekend or, or maybe the week before uh, I watched Enemy of the State with my kids um the the will smith and gene hackman movie from i guess it's probably 15 years old uh now right. and uh, it was eerie uh my wife and i went to sit in the theater uh way back when with some friends 
and I remember walking out of the theater and looking behind bushes and things, you know, and <laughs> and and it's uh, and the world has changed so much since then, uh, and surveillance is uh, is everywhere, you know. It was then it, it was a very uh, deliberate uh, thing that you know this organization was having to to reposition satellites and things like that, and now there are cameras and. And like you said, uh, you know, just giving away fingerprints and everything at, at everywhere you turn. Uh, there was lots to feed that story, I'm sure. And I think of, um, I enjoyed the movie Minority Report, too. Yes, yes. Just, I'm thinking it was just fun to explore it. And uh, it is kind of comical since my email, um, it wasn't hacked, but there were some interesting things. I was not receiving all of my emails. And um, oh, that's funny! I wrote this story for this uh, for this anthology, and I'm like, okay, so I'm a little paranoid now myself. So, <laughs> so, so is David Gatewood uh, really an NSA plant who is uh, getting people to uh, so. to dream up scenarios that they could implement on us? Is that what it, what I'm picking up on? Anyway, I'm going with yes. I don't have to answer. That. <laughs> Thanks, I think Wendy. we're losing our connection. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lucas Bale, our uh, our attendee from across the pond, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. T- tell us a little bit about your story and and what the motivation for it was. Um, well, like uh, like Michael Bunker just did, I'll I'll take the motivation first. David, uh, David is my editor too, and for pretty much the same reasons as Mike. I really don't want to upset him. So um, I always wanted to be part of <laughs> any anthology he had anything to do with. As I saw the sales rankings and the authors that were being involved, I just thought, yeah, I really need to be on board with that. So um, I basically just begged him to uh, to let me into uh, one of his anthologies. And he kept saying, no, don't be ridiculous. Um, and uh, I just got the CIA to stake out his house and uh, stake him. So eventually he said yes, um, but I think that took a lot longer than uh, I would have liked it to. Um, as to where the story came from, I, you know, I, I really don't know. I was I was surfing and I saw this article on the high frequency active rural research program in Alaska, and I love anything to do with Alaska. And the fact that it had just been shut down. Uh, around about the same time as the Russian government had started to increase its military presence across the uh, the Bering Strait, so I started having a look at that. Uh, and apparently, you know, Hart was was um, involved in bringing down the Malaysian Airways flight. That was one of the the really cool uh, conspiracy theories that I, I sort of looked at. But as I as I started to think about what I wanted to write about. I thought, well, knowing Michael Bunker and the sort of stuff he's written with uh, with Wick in the past, I just thought everyone was going to write stories about conspiracy theories, obviously. So I wanted to take something, take it slightly differently. And so instead, uh, I kind of looked at the story as an allegory for the themes surrounding conspiracy theories, you know, the sort of fear of the unknown, mistrust, paranoia. Uh, all coming from a lack of understanding. And I took two characters from very different backgrounds, as different as you could hope for, um, and put them in a really difficult situation created ostensibly by um, by Harp. Um, so, that, I mean, I just wanted to come to it, I think, from a, from a very different perspective from what I imagined everyone else would be writing, but take the same sort of underlying theme. And what's the name of your story? Uh, my story is called Chukotka, which is the name of the peninsula which reaches into the Bering Strait and can be seen from uh, the uh, from the U.S. territory in Alaska. Gotcha. So you have no connection to the story other than uh, seeing the, the news and, and kind of giving a, a what-if type scenario with it? No, nothing at all. I, I, I kind of like um, survival stories. Um, and I like stories where people are tested emotionally um, as much as physically. Um, and I, I just like the idea of this um, this old guy, this um, um, Siberian hunter, 
uh, trying to recapture something that had been lost to him in his uh, in his past, in his youth, as he grew older. Um, and it just sort of went from there, really. Awesome. Uh, Chris Porteau, tell it us is. about your, your odd story uh, <laughs> to the collection. Well, thanks for that introduction. <laughs> well, I, I was a beta reader for it, and uh, yeah, that's, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, you have to re- recuse <laughs> yourself. Uh, all right, so the, the title is uh, The French Deception, and that ch- title changed, I think, 18 or 19 times. Um, when David first. As it should, to uh, keep the. Right. The well, that's the, the only way to keep it fresh, right? right? And that's and right. also, you know, to, uh, mislead everybody. That's right. Uh, but yeah, I got an email from David late one night, uh, which is unusual, though it you know may not sound that way. Um, and it said, "Hey, I'm putting together this collection. Would you like to be in it?" And I immediately turned around and looked behind me to see if that email was meant for anybody else. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I was, "Are you kidding? Yeah. Uh, how much do I have to pay you to be included?" Uh, so uh, he he ran some cons- conspiracy theory ideas by me, like the moon landing thing and uh, uh, some other stuff. And I was like, eh, I don't know. I'm kind of an armchair Civil War historian, uh, buff type guy. Uh, uh, Civil War buff, not like buff. buff. But anyway, uh, say that again. Yeah, but I'm bunch. <laughs> tip your waitress. Uh, so I I I kind of came up with this idea of. Uh, Lincoln in the Civil War and you know, I mean, if you know much about Civil War history, the Union screwed up a lot, especially early in the war. Uh, they couldn't find the right commander to, uh, to to make the army do what they wanted. Plus, the South had excellent, excellent leadership since they had most of, most of the uh, from the guy from Mississippi, since they had most of the uh, military academies. I mean, and, and I right. always think of the Civil War, and, and this is a moment of seriousness. I always think of the Civil War as like this perfect tragedy. It could have been a Shakespearean tragedy in five acts, each act being one of the years of the war, and it could not have been set up to last longer. The the South had fewer resources, uh, uh, but but better leaders. Uh, and they had the the fire in the belly of the the soldiers who were trying to defend the, what they considered to be an invader, the North coming down and invading. Meanwhile, you had the Union, who didn't have quite as good a leaders at least early in the war. They had all of the resources, they had the navy, and so you had all these these two sides with different strengths pitted against each other, and it almost couldn't have been set up to make a longer make for a longer conflict. And so, I've been fascinated with the period, and I thought. Well, what kind of conspiracy theory could I come up with? And of course, the Lincoln Lincoln assassination came right to the, to uh, the front of my mind. But everybody knows John Wilkes Booth and you know the Ford's Theater and all that. So I wanted to do something different. And originally, I decided I wanted to do a uh, uh, sort of tongue in cheek thing. And and my pun punning side uh, said, well, how about we take the French connection and turn it into the French confection? And we can have some French dignitary poison Lincoln with candy. Hmm, that sounds like fun. Uh, and the whole story was going to be the setup to the joke, which is the title. I know, that's crazy. So I started doing research, and I found out all of these things that were actually going on at the time, like Napoleon III invading uh, Mexico and having ambitions to do more than uh, just invade Mexico and uh, Seward. Uh, uh, in Lincoln's cabinet, worried about the French actually coming across the Rio Grande, and and, and there was this uh, Napoleon, uh, Prince Napoleon, who was a, a nephew, I believe, of of the Napoleon everybody knows, came for a state visit in August of 1861, several months after the war started, and and the it couldn't have been more of a caricature. We have these backwoods folks in this big white house trying to impress these uh, 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 French aristocrats, and it was just, it was every uh, bad movie scene you've ever seen like that. So I'm thinking about all this context, and I'm like, wow, what if the French actually tried to replace Lincoln? Uh, and so my the whole premise of my story, and in most of it is written as a letter from 1865 uh, from, the, from the guy that they chose to replace Lincoln, uh, the premise of the story is that the French replaced it very early in the war uh, with a uh, doppelganger, uh, and he proceeds to make all kinds of bad decisions for the Union early on. 
Um, and that's kind of the excuse for the war lasting as long as it did. And there are lots of other twists and turns. I won't give any more of it away than that. But, but it's a very sort of history-based uh, take on that era. Um, so, and, and the story is couched uh, within a, a, another scene uh, that, was, that I thought was brilliant. Uh, so you've, you've kind of got a conspiracy with a conspiracy. Right. Um, yeah, and I won't say any more than that, or, or I'll give it away. But right. if you're uh, a history, buff, I think you'll, if you're a history buff, particularly of the Civil War, I think you'll enjoy the story. But if you're a military history buff, I think you'll enjoy other aspects of it as well. Excellent. Um, and we also have stories by uh, you mentioned Richard Gleaves, uh, and uh, I've read his story in the collection so far because I'm a Richard Gleaves fan, uh, and I'm. Uh, I am fascinated by the JFK assassination and all of the uh, the all of the questions surrounding it. Um, who else is involved in the anthology, David? Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got Ernie Lindsay, who wrote a story about um, a light bulb that will never burn out, but unfortunately, we're not allowed to see that light bulb because it would destroy the world economy. Um, Forbes West wrote a story about um, a it's uh, a video game that created by the CIA that creates psychosis. Uh, it's weird. Um, <laughs> well, that goes without saying. Once you said Forbes, we knew. Yeah, that. once yeah, uh, right. Forbes is a walking conspiracy theory. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Another bizarre one. Nick Cole wrote this this crazy story about a. It's a fear of the unknown and loathing in Hollywood in a Hunter S. Thompson style. It's just, uh, it's crazy and brilliant. A, uh, a gonzo journalism type style? Exactly. Um, Jennifer Ellis wrote a touching story about uh, the search for Elvis, who, as we all know, is still alive. Absolutely. Is he in Canada with Jennifer? I, I heard that he's with Tupac and Biggie Smalls. Well, that, that makes perfect sense. Oh, she must have a full house. Well, yeah. she well, She's she got loves, an extra room in the basement. <laughs> he loves it when she calls him Big Pop. Don't we all. For sure. And uh, Peter Codron wrote a story called Heil Hitler, uh, which essentially attempts to explain away all conspiracy theories. Mm. And did you save that one for the last in the collection? No, that's right there in the Oh, I'm, okay. You don't have to buy the, it. Doesn't it's not a spoiler for the rest of the book. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, it, are there? Uh, is there anyone else, or is that uh, that the collection? Did I miss anyone? If I missed someone, I'm Ed, Ed Robertson. I did. Sorry, Ed. Uh, yeah, Ed Robertson uh, wrote a story about that. Um, sort of explains uh, Area 51. Um, it's called The Final Flight of Michael Aoki. I, I think almost anything I tell you about it would be spoilery, so we'll just leave it at that. Gotcha. gotcha. Does he channel Giorgio Tsoukalos in that story? I have no idea. The, the, the guy from Ancient Aliens with the crazy hair? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. I thought that was Nick Cole. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that since... Uh, uh, anyway, we'll just... Uh, we'll. <laughs> We love you, Nick Cole. That's all you we do. Know. Yeah, we do. That's, that's all you need to know. Uh, David, what's the challenge in putting together a collection like this, where you're uh, working with writers uh, of varied style and who all bring different ideas to the table? What What are some of the challenges for an editor in in putting together something massive like this? Well, the the challenge is. I, is for the most part, it's just getting lucky that a bunch of talented writers actually want to contribute to the anthology idea you came up with, which you acknowledge is kind of weird to begin with. Um, once they've uh, accepted and you've got a talented group like this, you just know that you're going to get good stuff. Um, so, I mean, perhaps the biggest challenge is just making sure that I had enough different types of voices in there so that it wasn't all the same kind of story. Uh, and, you know, fortunately, I was I was able to get some different types of writers, so I think we've got a nice variety. Excellent. Um, 
listening to all of your descriptions of stories, uh, most of them are stories that are uh, mostly true or at least uh, really dip into uh, current events and really uh, unlock the imagination of the, the what if. Uh, I want to go around the circle here and just ask you, uh, what is it about being a fiction writer and and uh, dreaming up these stories uh in writing them, how much do you um, – and not just this collection but in your fiction in general, how much do you pull from real life, and what is the um, the power of fiction to be able to convey these ideas? Hey, hey uh, can I interrupt for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I forgot another author. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Eric Tazi or Totsi, I'm not sure. Um, he wrote a story uh, – I actually – solicited him specifically because I knew he would be perfect for this story. He wrote a story about the moon landing. So since he actually is a director, uh, I knew that he would know how to pull that off. And um, uh, what he's written is a story about how the moon landing actually did happen. Uh, and it was also filmed on a sound uh, studio in uh, Hollywood. I knew it. I knew it. And, I knew and it. Eric also uh, was the, uh, the uh, documentarian uh, for JPL for the Mars missions a few years back. Exactly. So I, I told him this was the role he was born to play. Yeah, he actually faked that one, so it was awesome to have him. <laughs> well, he he has 3D rendering software now. It's, uh, right. it's so much easier now than it was in the 60s. Right. Awesome. I, I can't wait to, re uh, to read Eric's uh, entry. I'm, I'm actually reading Eric's Apocalypse Weird book right now, and it's fantastic. He's a great writer. Um, he is. He's a fantastic writer. Uh, but, w Wendy, uh, will you start uh, talking about just fiction writing in general and how uh, the idea that uh, that things may or may not be true, but they're grounded in just enough reality uh, that it really opens up the imagination? Sure. Um, I think with that, I, I can speak for myself. I, I finally figured out why I became a writer, and I think it, it – the root of it is that I continued to have more empathy than I knew what to do with, with people. And I was constantly paying attention and, um, I knew I would come off strange if I went around trying to reach out and hug all these random strangers. So what I, what I tried to figure out and I just channel it, I channel it, I pay attention and I, um, I channel that depth of empathy and feeling for people in all different kinds of scenarios. And I had that, enormous imagination where um, putting myself in their shoes, I can I can translate that into the written word. And I feel like um, it's comical I'm having to speak right now because I feel like I'm able to do that much better <laughs> through writing. So, um, so that's, the, you know, how much do I pull from my real life? Everything, all the time. I'm constantly paying attention. I'm constantly picking up things that I use, take notes, and, um, and letting that just seep through my work. It's, it's all the time. <laughs> uh, when you are dr dreaming up a new project, uh, is there typically uh, a, a spark of creativity that, that uh, launches a story idea or uh, you know, do you kind of purposefully develop stories in a certain direction? No, usually it is a spark. That's a great question, and I really love when that happens, and a lot of times I'm like, come on, <laughs> I wait for it because uh, that that is it's the impetus, that's the um, the compass, that's what I like to go back to, and um, you know that hook. Another way to word it would be the hook. The, the what is begun, what begins in the what if question that branches out to be um, what many of these authors have said, you know, just unraveled in a in a more woven, complex um, topic that is um, thought out and and written in a way that intrigues throughout. But yeah, I love the spark. I absolutely love that. I love um, a character. A lot of times it starts with me um, with a character, but it doesn't have to. A concept is sometimes just as enticing for some of my novels that I've written. So yeah, love it. Yeah, me too. Uh, Lucas Bale, most of my ideas come from dreams. Uh, I'll wake up and just have an idea that just seemed to come from nowhere, uh, which probably is a side effect of the HARP program. Um, you want to weigh in about where ideas come from? Um, when you when you ask Wendy um, about that sort of spark, it, it's, it's absolutely identical for me. 
Um, I, I wish there was some really cool place that I could tell you um, my ideas came from. Um, I remember, you know, reading um, various authors when I was a kid, sort of wondering where they got their ideas from, and I think most of them didn't ever have a brilliant answer for that question. <laughs> they just seem to come out of nowhere. You know, I, I, it's a cliche, but I carry around a notebook and a pen, and you know, I'll be, I'll be in the middle of doing something far more important, and I'll just get the notebook out and start writing because you know 20 minutes later I'll have forgotten it and I think every everything I've ever written uh, every scene every beat um, every entire book they all come from these moments which are really strange because you 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 can't possibly predict where they're going to come from and I really do have a book next to my bed and I do wake up in the morning and get a pen and my other half is a shipping operator, and you know she's up at three in the morning, you know, taking calls from Singapore or whatever. So she doesn't. She actually doesn't mind if I get up and start writing for twenty minutes, um, because those moments are golden, and you you just can't predict when they're going to come. And there's there's no rhyme or reason for what might spark them off either. They're just it could be something a, a, as random as um, you know seeing some kids playing. Um, in a field, you suddenly think, do you know what? That would work really well as a contrast to, you know, uh, yeah, you know, in one scene in a book I've got the coming out. The uh, one of the the main characters is watching some children playing, and then a, a gunship, you know, kind of a it's a space opera. This gunship comes overhead, and you know, it's supposed to reinforce this idea of the dystopian world that they live in. And, and he's kind of looking at these kids thinking, I wonder if any of them are going to grow up to be these murderous peacekeeper kind of soldiers. And it's, it's some, that, that just came to me because some kids are playing in, in a park somewhere, you know, which is probably a little depressing, actually. But, um, <laughs> you know, these things, they, they just come from nowhere. And I just think, one day I'm going to stop having these sparks and I'm going to think, right, well, I need to go and work in a coffee shop then. <laughs> but, you know, that's why I carry the book around. And, uh, you know, I wish I had some really cool story, but I don't. I just uh, I write down what comes to me as soon as I can. No, that's actually the the coolest story is that, uh, and you know, I think these little sparks of creativity come to us all. It's just, you know, maybe the artist is just more willing to stop and listen. I, I don't know. You know, call it what you will, but um, I think after a while, you if you've been writing books. Um, it, even for a little while, you, you realize that um, you sort of see them coming and you know how important they are. Right. And I think artists kind of grab them because they think, shit, I'm not going to have another one of those for weeks. So uh, right. I really, that's, 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 the, uh, that's the electricity bill paid for. I really need to grab that one. Yeah. So, yeah, I just think it's, it's seeing opportunity and, and grabbing it uh, for all your work. Yeah. Uh, Michael Bunker. A lot of your writing, um, I think it would be safe to say that most of your writing, uh, fits uh, into this genre of um, uh, you know, Amish sci-fi, or, uh, and that's probably pretty narrow for, for things like Wick. Uh, but you know, a lot of your stories have an overarching theme. Do, do your ideas come out of thinking of setting and thinking of – you know, a certain people group or a certain place in the world or, you know, is it a spark of an idea and then your natural progression is to couch it in that type uh, scene and scenario? Uh, I that think all those, all? yeah, I think all those things can be true um, at some level. You know, uh, I do write mostly uh, about this uh, tension between, um, you know, humanity and technology and uh, how, you know, I, I do live uh, as a plain person. And so I live off grid. When I walk out of my office, I'm, I, I might, I could be back in the 1800s, you know, and it's, uh, we don't, we don't have electrical power at our cottage and all that. So uh, a lot of it's a very, very natural um, thing for me to tell these stories because it, it's something I'm thinking about all the time. Uh, and, and the next thing is, it's like, um, I, I, I've studied a lot of history, and so uh, by practice, really, um, a lot of the best thing to play, best place to uh, plagiarize from is history, because there's all these great stories. Yeah. And uh, and for example, the Last Pilgrims was basically I was studying about the Waldenses, and um, 
uh, in the Alps, you know, and just decided to take that story and cast it into the future. And that led to Wick. And, and really, um, in a lot of ways, my own life has been stranger than fiction. And so um, what I really hear, I want to tell you the real, the real deal is I just write stuff down and then I send it to Gatewood and he throws it away. And then he writes, uh, makes it better. <laughs> the bet makes it better, and um, hey, David, it, thanks for that. By the way, so so you are <laughs> okay. David Gatewood's spark of inspiration. Is that what I'm hearing? I, either that or, or some other uh, more uh, deleterious term. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I sometimes I'm just I, I feel like uh, I'm just playing a trick on everyone. Yes. <laughs> so I put something out there. I was like, you know what? You know what would be great? Amish robot Frankenstein, and then we just <laughs> laugh and we laugh. And then I write out this story, and I think everybody's just going to think, okay, he's gone past it now. He's crazy. And then and then David makes it good, and so then it works. So you just throw out an idea, and, and then you're like, holy crap, that might actually work. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, and, you know, and I, I, I do uh, glean or uh, quite a bit from, you know, conversations a lot when I'm talking with people and – People will throw out some, some crazy stuff about my life, you know, and, oh, what if this happened and what did that happen? And then you'll think, oh, that would be good as part of the story. So it's really just thievery and fraudulence and uh, and, and a whole lot of uh, homemade beer and cigars. Which factors perfectly into this collection. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay, all right. Uh, Chris Porto, what about you? Where where does the, the spark, the muse, uh, whatever you want to call it, where does it come from? Um, well, you know, I don't really know what to add to what everybody else is saying, uh, but I, I would say that in the case of this story, uh, you know, David approached me and I was like, okay, well, what would be cool to do? And then I totally changed the the focus of the story based on the research and, and it went from being a comical joke with the title for a punchline to, to an actually a semi-serious story. Um, I guess my main... Uh, the main thing that I do is somebody says, okay, we want you to write a novel and we want it to sort of be like my apocalypse weird novel. Uh, and we want it to have this general stuff in it. And so then I decide, well, okay, who are the characters that are, first thing I ask is who are the characters that are going to be in this novel and what, what's going to be their conflict? Cause there's always, a, there's always an arc that happens with my characters um, and they're the most they're the most important thing. And I, I consider myself just sitting down in front of a in front of a laptop, watching something happening, and listening to, to people speak. And then I just write it all down. Um, so I, I take a very character centric focus. If that's if I know this isn't really answering your question, but um, the, the, my spark is I take these people and I throw them in this pit, and this is how they react, um, and that's the story. So, sure. Um, well, that's excellent question. You, so the the people come to you first. Yeah, I mean, I, I have I have a frame, I have an idea. Like, okay, this is going to be a conspiracy story about the Lincoln assassination. Okay, well, then what? You know, that's that's just a topic. It's not a it's not a, a it's not the meat on the bone. So, and the meat on the bone to me is always the characters and what's happening to them. Gotcha. Can, can I ask Chris a question, or is that I absolutely? Mean, go ahead. Um, I, I have this weird thing where I'll be writing, and I'll have a vague, sometimes even a quite solid idea where the scene's going to go, and then at the end of the the day, I'll kind of look back and think, "Geez, I had no idea that was going to happen." Chris, you just said that you know your characters are where you, your most of your focus is. Do you find that you'll kind of write a scene, and the characters will have just taken it in a direction? But you really just had no idea it was going to end up there. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the the best I do is I sketch out. If I don't sketch something out, I will stare at the the screen and the cursor will blink because I'm I'm by nature a very anal retentive person, and no. if I don't have Shut I know up. Michael Say Michael no. I know the people that know me on this call <laughs> it surprises them. But my point is, if I don't have some direction, I I'm afraid to step anywhere for hitting a landmine. So I I sketch something. But then I plop my characters down into the middle of the sketch, and I let them develop whatever's going to happen in terms of the, the, the fleshing, uh, fleshing it out. So, yes, absolutely. He's going to give okay. you a spreadsheet for this call, by the way. 
Yes, that's right. With the, ex- the exact amount of time each one had on it so that you can fix that in post so we're all equal and I can sleep tonight. <laughs> Which is great because Nick Cole's not on here, so the pie chart won't be like 80% Nick Cole. <laughs> that's right. Uh, one more time, we love you, Nick Cole. Anyway. Uh, David, what is um, – I, I've talked with several writers uh, in the in the recent past, and uh, one thing that has uh, really amazed uh, a lot of us is the spirit of collaboration that seems to be uh, that seems to permeate the indie community, and especially over the last couple, you know, three or four years, uh, has really uh, helped a lot of people by. Um, uh, not only working with each other for inspiration, but sharing audiences and things like that. Would you like to speak uh, about the uh, the collaborative nature of writing and publishing and what it's like getting a group of people like that together to work? Yeah, so I, I definitely agree that there's a strong community and – Obviously, wouldn't be possible without uh, all the social media and and all oh, that that's that's come along. Um, so it's kind of good timing that self publishing came to arise at the same time that all that was available. And you've got folks out there like uh, Hugh Howie uh, who are drawing people together and actually encouraging them, um, like like Hugh did, to go ahead and write fan fiction in my uh, universe. Michael's now done the same thing with his Pennsylvania universe. Um, rather than people viewing each other as competitors, they're saying, look, let's all share our ideas together. Um, I, I imagine that for the most part, writing is an unusually solitary activity. Uh, I know editing is. So when you have the opportunity to come together with other people and do a collaborative project, uh, it's got to scratch an itch that you don't usually get to scratch. True. Uh, what about any of the other of you? Uh, do you have any thoughts on collaboration and, and why it's important? Um, as a as a relative newcomer to the indie scene, if, if it can be called a scene, um, I remember when I, I – Hugh Howey was the guy that, that got me first started um, because I read his blog and I emailed him back in January of last year and – um, I was I wasn't really looking for agents, but it was you know it's what I, everyone was thinking about um, until I started looking at self publishing as, as a as an option. And I read his blog, I emailed him, he emailed me back, um, and then I emailed my bank and uh, he emailed me back. And I kept thinking, wow, you know, it's nice doing really well, you know. But everyone you talk to, I think. Anyone who you email or, or you contact on Facebook or wherever, they're all really willing to talk to you about how they've got where they've got to. And it's not like any of them are bothered about hiding how they got there or, or sort of hiding the secrets of their success. They, they just share everything. And I, it, it, that spills through into every sort of collaboration, whether it's on anthologies like this or it's on Uh, Apocalypse Weird, that kind of thing that Michael's uh, currently doing with Nick Cole and and a bunch of other really supremely gifted authors. And I think that's that's the thing. I think every author really has this attitude that we're not in it for ourselves. We we love the fact that our friends and colleagues are just as successful or even more successful than we are. And it's that attitude, I think, permeates everything that the indie community is doing. And that's why it's successful, I think. And and I wanted to add one thing to that. Um, The reader ultimately benefits from that. Um, I know that I pick authors that I admire, um, and I say, would you please beta read this story for me? Would you please tell me how I can make it better? And, you know, you have to set ego aside to do that, and you have to be willing to to take critiques uh, like a man or a a woman. Um, (laughs) I say, I I didn't get through there. Uh, and just make the story better because at the end of the day, the only person that counts – well, not the only person, but the person that really counts the most is the reader. And I don't say that because they're going to be the one plunking down their cash, but because you're writing to be read. You're writing to have somebody appreciate your work, whether it's – appreciate means I liked it or just I read it and spent some time on it. Every time I write a story in my afterward, the first thing I do is to thank the reader for their time 
because they, yeah. I don't care whether it was ninety nine cents or ninety nine dollars. They spent their time reading stuff that I wrote, um, and this community makes that so much easier to, to to produce a quality work for somebody else to look at. And so that's that's one of the things I really value about it. Excellent, uh, Wendy. Would you like to add anything about collaboration? Uh, I, I'm looking back, and I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for my critique partners and the oh, so many authors that have just prodded me along and encouraged me. And it can be a rough road sometimes, whether you're indie or trying for traditional or however you're going at this. It can it can be tough, and to have people that I mean, I tell my critique partner, I love all the red lines. I love I love when she marks it up. You know, I have two now, but um, I think yeah, to have that honest feedback where someone is truly helping you grow an author there's nothing like that and um, I like what um, I forget who said it just a bit ago but the idea of um, not seeing it as a competition or having competitors but really being able to be happy and joyful about other people's success I think it makes it an entirely different experience and I, I love being part of it I love everything I've um, uh, gone through with the whole independent route and it's it's a great community. I'm just I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. And it's we have so many opportunities now that we did not have um, years ago, and it's made it um, so much more enjoyable. I think. Absolutely, uh, great answer, Wendy. Uh, Michael, you are possibly the king of collaboration uh, with <laughs> co-authored books uh, with Chris uh, A. Walt and with uh, Nick Cole and Kevin G. Summers, uh, and building a collaborative universe uh, like uh, was mentioned with Apocalypse Weird. Um, how is this spirit of collaboration affecting indie publishing and publishing as a whole these days? Well, I think it's uh, it's really kind of a uh, both a result and uh, a uh, I guess uh, I can't even, uh, as a writer I can't even think of a, a good word for it. It's uh, it, it, as uh, David was saying. There's this um, this timing, you know, of social media, a lot of people being in constant communication. Uh, we have this uh, you know indie kind of explosion and kind of Hugh was really at the forefront of all of that, and Hugh helped me a lot uh, going back to when I was kind of just getting started and. Um, and then, you know, I kind of looked up one day and, and I was kind of drafting off you and there were people that were drafting off me and we were all talking and, um, I got invited into a, an anthology maybe two years ago and was so fired up and excited just to be able to, uh, produce a story that was going to be, you know, in a book with a lot of people I really admired. And, uh, and then it, it just kind of turns around where you get to be that person too for other people. And, you know, as far as how it's, uh, affecting the industry you know it's uh, I've had the opportunity now to kind of brush up against uh, trad publishing and I've done some uh, some work with uh, Nick Cole who's a traditionally published author as well as an indie and uh, and uh, it's really uh, painful the way that that system works and there's just really not an op that much of an opportunity outside of a ver some very uh, notable exceptions uh, uh, for uh, authors to work together and you're, it's really almost uh, uh, not encouraged and so you know the w just the way that indie publishing is you know the more that you're involved in the community the more it's really just a very very natural thing and sometimes it's also a, a necessary thing I think Chris can tell you you know uh, I, he and I started talking when he when he very first uh, was was putting out uh, uh, shadows burned in and and I lean on him a lot now because I I just don't have much time and so a lot of times I'll just pop in on Chris and Facebook and say hey guy I need you to do something for me and um and, and so it's really really been a great help and you, know, you meet people like Ben Adams great artists like Mike Corley uh people like uh David here who who is a fantastic editor and uh, they all really have almost that same spirit so it's just been a great opportunity and it's been a great time um one question I had for each one of you is a great answer, by the way, Michael. Uh, okay. But um, there are uh, – anthologies have always been a part of science fiction and fantasy writing, uh, and they are really making a big splash in the indie community now. Uh, and all of you have written longer works and short stories or uh, you know maybe novelette length uh, or whatever stories to contribute to anthologies. What is the difference in writing – a, a full-length novel 
length piece as opposed to a short story. Uh, I'll start with you, Lucas. Um, I it, it was a kind of a weird situation for me. My first short story I wrote, uh, and out my partner was was pretty ill, and um, for about a month. We had no idea just how serious it was going to be. Fortunately, it turned out to be something that was resolvable. But um, during that time, I, I couldn't really focus on the the longer um, piece that I was doing. That I think it was the second book in uh, Beyond the Wall, which is the, the series that I'm, I'm writing at the moment. Um, and so I, I kind of wrote this story called uh, What It Means to Survive, and it was... Um, it, 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 I didn't even think about publishing it at the time. It was just a kind of a, I, I wanted to write something to kind of take my mind off what was going on around me. And I found that I wrote, I normally write in the, the third person uh, present, but with quite a strong, uh, third person past, but with a very strong point of view. And this one, whenever I write short now, I always write um, first person present. And I find that it just comes so much more easily to me and so I actually use short stories now as a, as a way to just simply sort of refresh my creativity, I suppose, and just get away from the longer, more complex um, work. And sometimes it's, it's easier just to go do something else and then come back. And short stories, I think, are, are good for that. And they're quite good fun, too. And I like the fact that there seems to be a resurgence uh, of the interest in short stories because it's so much easier to publish them now. Um, you don't need an anthology. You can just put one out and say, look, here's, here's a short. You, you know, have a look at it. Yeah, and shifting perspective from third person to first person or vice versa uh, is a great tip for writers because uh, sometimes you can fall into the uh, familiarity of writing a certain way and just you know, flipping the script like that uh, really can open up uh, a, a big opportunity sometimes. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think it, it, it has the effect of introducing you, especially for someone like me, who's very, very much just starting out learning learning the, the craft of writing and the you know the art of trying to tell stories that pe- keep people interested. Um, it, it, it introduces you to new techniques that you can then take into the you know the other type of uh, storytelling. So you know it, it, it's much harder in short stories to um, detail the setting um, in a way that's much shorter and more almost perfunctory you know you, you, you want to get it written in a way that tells you the reader as much as you can but at the same time doesn't you know take the story too long uh, because you've obviously you essentially got a word count um, and that sort of um, cutting down, cutting out extraneous detail um, can filter into a much cleaner, more concise prose when you go to the longer form as well. Uh, Wendy, what about you? Uh, what is the, the difference in uh, for you creatively in structuring a shorter piece as opposed to a longer piece? I would agree with what Lucas just said. Um, you just have to be so much more selective, more focused, cut down on the subplots and truncate the, the layers that you're tempted to you know, build into a, a, a novel or a story that you know, allows for such a thing. You have to be much more intentional about having your character say exactly, you know, get to the point. <laughs> the whole thing is kind of like you have to get to it in a, a much uh, yeah, shorter time frame. And, um, and it does. It, it's a microscope. It helps you to see, and it it forces an author to look at and to select and decide what what scene, what um, what exactly are they wanting the reader to experience. Good point, uh, Michael. What about you? Is there a, a a difference in your process when you write short versus long? There probably is. I don't know that I can identify it. I know that almost every story that I write, no matter the length, uh, I try to um, put it in in a world yeah. that uh, uh, that is so big that my hope is that the reader is going to want more of it, even if I have no intention of writing more of it. And so, um, you know, th- that's true uh, when I've done you know novellas. And uh, right now, I'm rewriting a novella uh, called Futurity. That's going to be. I'm writing it into a full length novel. And I think the story has been there for that, and uh, 
you know, uh, I, my hope is that uh, when I do re- read reviews, that the uh, readers are going to say, "I want to see this in the movie. I want to see this. I want to see more of this world." Uh, with Pennsylvania, you know, uh, I intentionally uh, wrote the story in a way that I that there was so much that could be told in that world, which is one of the reasons that there's been so many fan fiction uh, uh, authors writing f- uh, fan fiction in it. As far as the process and how it's different, it, it, it's a little bit more difficult for me to write a short story because I'm not naturally, I don't naturally tend toward that that type of storytelling. Uh, and so I, what I really do is try to uh, focus in on a maybe a, I, I, I envision the full world that could be a novel or that could be a long series, and then I try to focus in on a, on a short little part of that story and tell that story, and that's that works well for me. Do you have any uh, tips or suggestions that you could give to writers that uh, of ways to to make your universe so rich that there are untold stories just sitting out there waiting uh, to come out of it? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm working on that right now because I'm going to be doing a seminar on world building in Austin on May 3rd. Uh, that's going to be at the uh, one of the half price books there in Austin. And so I'm just now kind of putting these thoughts together. My, my main um, uh, advice would be that you have to uh, realize that the world ha- has to serve the story and not the other way around. Uh, and so story is, is certainly primary. But, um, you you know, in my mind, I just really try to imagine it a lot of times before I write, uh, uh, really kind of extensively imagine all of the elements uh, that exist in the real world, uh, character, culture, so, uh, society, the way people might vote or not vote, the way, uh, what types of machines would serve this world. Just, uh, there's a long list of, of questions I ask myself, and then uh, rather than uh, dump all of those things into the story, which is more limiting. The, the more detail that you add actually limits uh, the the world, and a lot of people don't realize that. A, a, a lot of times, it's hints and uh, a uh, inference about the way things are done, and then you leave that wide open. And what that does is allow the reader to build this big world in their own mind. What what kind of world would this exist in? And I think that's the way you create a broad world is is that you have this rich concept but you don't write it all you just infer a lot of it that's great advice uh chris what about you uh what's the difference for you in crafting short story versus full novel um well certainly i mean the obvious answer is scope right you 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 only have so much space to work so many words to work with and so you can't tell the history of western civilization in five thousand words um so there's that uh, but honestly, I approach um, everything I write almost as a almost in a short story way. And what I mean by that, just to take my Apocalypse Weird novel because it's the latest long fiction uh, example that I have. Uh, so it's about sixty-five thousand words. It's written in three sections. Each section has seven chapters. Each chapter has two main scenes in it. By the way, did I mention I'm anal retentive? <laughs> Uh, but my point is, my focus as I was writing, of course I had the larger you know, uh, pers- uh, perspective and, and plot in mind, but the focus as I was writing was what's going to happen in this scene with these characters, and then how's that going to lead to the next scene, and how does that make the chapter work, and how does the chapter make the section work, and how does the section add to the novel. Um, so I don't – if I tried to think of the novel while I'm writing, I would, I would be paralyzed. Um, so I have to focus on the at the small, the lower level, um, and so I just tend to approach things uh, in chunks that way. And so I guess really the difference for me is I just write a chunk for a short story as opposed to a series of chunks for a novel. Gotcha. And do you feel the need to have uh, full and total resolution at the end of the short story, or do short stories tend to? Leave room to uh, uh, to kind of lead uh, lead the reader uh, wondering what happens next. Well, I, I subscribe to Poe's philosophy of composition. I see it as my job as an as a writer, but as any artist, is to have an emotional impact on the reader. reader. And to me, the the most effective way to do that is to have it at the end of the piece, where they close the book or turn off the Kindle or whatever, and go, "Wow, hey, this is what I think about that." 
Um, and if that's the last time they ever think of it, that's fine. Um, but my point is, uh, a way to accomplish that is not to have closure, right? And then they closed the coffin and he got lowered into the ground and everybody went on with their life. Well, okay, that doesn't have a lot of emotional resonance for me. Right. Um, so I, I like to write in a way that the last thing the reader reads um, before they close the book is going to make them walk away and think something uh, – think something – let them engage with the work in a way that they think of something that wasn't in the work. I don't want them just to move on to the next thing they were going to read. I want them to remember what I wrote. And so uh, uh, not resolving things is a great way to get them to think about it. Gotcha. Uh, and, and I like that too. I like to leave the reader just kind of in a in a state of befuddlement uh, at the end you know, as to, oh my gosh, that could – go in so many different ways and and let it seems like the story stays alive uh in their mind uh if you leave exactly. them something to kind of chew on and 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 work through uh right and they remember you you're you're not the guy that just wrote the trip to the 7-eleven story you know you're the guy that wrote the trip to the 7-eleven story where the little girl was run over by the car <laughs> right at the end of the story right um so. by the way i've not killed little girls at 7-elevens in any of my stories but uh that's, that was conjecture. Uh, <laughs> David Gatewood, uh, Tales of Tinfoil comes out Friday, April 17th. Uh, it will be available uh, on Kindle and uh, all the uh, ebook stores, uh, I'm sure. And you're also having a, a Facebook launch party the next week, is that right? Uh, yes. Um, Tales of Tinfoil will be available only on Amazon. Okay. Uh, so, or, or um, we can get an, the print copy as well through Amazon or Create Space. And yes, we'll have a launch party uh, on Facebook on uh, the twenty fourth. That's Friday at five p.m. Awesome. What uh, what's coming up next for you? Um, it's uh, to be determined. But depending on uh, the success of this, I'd like to do more in the tinfoil vein. I've proposed that. Something along the same lines, but dealing with famous hoaxes uh, might be the next place to go. I, I, I've been just really pleased with how well this turned out. Um, and so um, rather than like completely changing course, I think more of this would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you to, uh, to hire you as an editor or uh, to kind of follow along with, with what projects you have coming up? So uh, my website is www.alonetrout.com, um, and uh, I do have a newsletter there, which is strictly for the anthologies. If anyone is interested in learning about what anthologies are coming up, please sign up there. Awesome. Uh, Wendy Miller, what about you? What's coming up next from you, and where can people uh, find you to connect with your work? Oh, okay. I um, recently released a book, and it's part of a series. But I, I'm I'm pretty addicted to putting these books out, so I'm I'm working on something right now. About a, I'm about a quarter of the way through that I am hoping to release this fall a psychological suspense. And they can reach me Facebook, Twitter. I'm, I'm out there. I'm on all the social media sites. Then you would look it up, uh, Wendy Payne Miller. So, okay. Thank you. So Excellent. Much. And and we can find your your back catalog of work and 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 dig into to what you've got out there already. Yep. All right. Uh, what about you, Lucas Bale? Uh, what's what's coming up from you, and where can people connect with you? Well, uh, David was uh, rolling his eyes at me because I had for the third book on the trot, I had to tell him that he's not getting the whole thing because I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> um, book three in the Beyond the Wall series is uh, a shroud of night and tears that comes out in late May. Uh, David and I will be working on that together, by which uh, I mean David will rewrite it and I will just click uh, <laughs> accept all uh, on track changes. I do wish you got so far. It's not ready. just me. Good. No, seriously. I just, uh, if he, he, you just, David, don't, don't put track changes on. Seriously, it's just not worth it. Just change it, send it back to me, and that way I don't know how much you've changed in it, man. Uh, there'll be... Yeah, that's the third book. The fourth comes out at the end of the year. Um, I've got another anthology. Um, I'll be working with Sam Prouter um, later in the year on uh, time travel anthology. Um, and 
and yeah, just a, a, a bunch of other projects. And I've got to pitch something to Nick Cole as well, uh, which by which I'm probably going to have to send him beer and wine to grease the rails and all. Um, anyone who <laughs> wants to find my work can do so either at lucasbale.com um, or on my Amazon page. It's probably my Amazon author page. That's the easiest place to find anything. Um, that's it, really. I'm happy to receive emails from any of my readers who tell me that uh, my work is scientifically inaccurate. Um, which <laughs> <laughs> oh, you get those too? Uh, that was great. Thank, thanks for that one. Um, but I did then say to the guy, w would you like to beta read for me? And he said, yes, I'd love to. That'd be great. So um, he used to actually work on the space shuttle. So uh, he will be a fantastic beta reader. I'm looking forward to working with him. See, and that's a fantastic thing about a state of, of publishing and just communication in general now that we can actually get near instant feedback from an expert and they're willing to – uh, you know, contribute to our craft. What, what an excellent place to be in the world. It's a great example of that collaborative community you were talking about. Yeah. Do you know, it is, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I'm probably going to get really badly slammed for saying this, but I wonder how many sort of uh, traditionally published authors who've been doing this a long time would take something like that and go back to the guy straight away and say, well, actually, I'm really interested in hearing, you know, where I went wrong. So I can make sure it doesn't happen in the in the future because I you know I said to the guy look if it jarred for you um, even though there were relatively small points I thought if it jarred for you it might have jarred for someone else and I don't want that to happen and that, you know they're easily remedied um, and so yeah it was it was good actually and he was he was very pleasant about it as well it wasn't a bad review it was just a look you know if you can fix these things it'd be it'd be great so yeah I think it is a good thing it's a really good thing I was pleased to do it yeah it really is. Uh, Chris Porto, what's uh, I know you have a, a a new book that was recent recently released. Say that three times real fast. Um, <laughs> the, the Serenity Strain. Uh, what else right. do you have coming up, and where can people connect with you? Um, well, the next thing is going to be the third uh, tale set in Michael's world, actually, of Pennsylvania. Uh, the the name of the novella is Columbia, and it's the third uh, in a string of tales about a. Um, uh, military uh, commando unit that for, that fights for Trace, which are the, the good guys in Pennsylvania. Uh, that'll be coming out early May, um, uh, and that'll sort of finish up a storyline that I've been working on for oh I don't know close to uh, I don't know six or seven months now. I started with Gettysburg, um, so I'm finishing up that. And then the next big thing on my plate is uh, the sequel to the Serenity Strain, actually, which is an apocalypse weird novel. Um, and I'll start working on that this spring. It's supposed to be out sometime in the fall, I believe. Okay. Uh, Michael Bunker, uh, I know you have a huge book launch uh, that's right on the horizon. Uh, Hank, Hank, one yeah, more thing, ahead. just to tell people where to find yes, me. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean uh, to cut you up. No, no, that's my fault. I, should, I forgot. Uh, uh, you can find me at chrisporto.thirdscribe.com, and Porto is spelled P-O-U-R, unlike the UK Guardian, who tends to drop that U. It's mm -hmm. P-O-U-R-T-E-A-U. Great. Because the... the the UK Guardian always spells my name wrong, too. I just, it really upsets me. <laughs> <laughs> I just find it ironic that the English make spelling errors. I didn't think that was humanly possible. That's awesome. Especially not no, we, dropping we, the U. Yeah, exactly. You have like extra U's laying around over there. You put in words that don't even need them. It's just amazing. <laughs> right, it's not, I only make spelling errors to keep David Gatewood in work. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, to be honest, it's because you're a Frenchie and, you know, there's, uh, yeah, there's still some that's, bad that's blood there. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're still upset about yeah. that. That's right. Uh, Michael, you've got a, a big book launch uh, just on the horizon and uh, a lot of stuff brewing. Uh, where can people find you and what's coming up for you? Well, uh, I'm going to be launching Brother Frankenstein. Some people might have heard of that. It's going to be uh, it. coming out April 29th, and uh, looking really looking forward to that. I've got a, a hundred projects going on. Uh, my next thing that I'm actually working on is a, a nonfiction uh, rewrite and extension of Surviving Off Off Grid. I'm also working oh, on cool. a rewrite and and a realization of a uh, novella I wrote called Futurity. And since I might have one or two people who actually read my stuff that are listening to this, I also have about six first-in-series that I've written, and I hope to start 
start uh, writing some second in series um, uh, down the road this <laughs> this year as well. Before I start getting uh, <laughs> cold pitch, pitch, uh, pitchforks outside of my house for Cold Harbor and uh, and Oklahoma, uh, let people know I'm going to be working on those too. So uh, I just a lot of stuff to do. I've uh, got some some more collaborations working uh, out. There's at least three more um, Bombo Dawson stories that are being worked on, and uh, there'll be plenty coming out. Nice. And people can find me at Michael Bombo. Com, and uh, you can always follow me on Facebook, and I'm there pretty regularly. Great. Uh, David Gatewood, thank you so much for uh, for not only uh, putting out such a fantastic collection of stories and curating that and uh, getting this group of folks together, uh, but thank you for uh, putting the show together and, and coming on. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Hank. I really appreciate you having all of us on. Absolutely. And uh, we'll put links to everyone's uh, websites and places where they can connect in the show notes. And uh, I I hope you have a great launch, David. I have pre-ordered my copy, and I encourage everyone else to go to the link in the show notes uh, to pre-order or order your copy of Tales of Tinfoil. 